This morning's reading is taken from Genesis 41. Genesis 41 details Joseph's rise to power in Egypt through his interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams. This passage highlights Jesus' faithfulness to God and his rise from being a prisoner to becoming a powerful leader in Egypt, demonstrating God's providence and plan. Genesis 14, 1 to 16. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the river bank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy, full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I'm, I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So, Joseph sent for, so Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he quickly bought from the dungeon. When he shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot, I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Joseph attributes his ability to interpret dreams to God. He tells Pharaoh that both dreams are a warning from God about seven years of abundance in Egypt, followed by seven years of severe famine. Now reading from verse 28. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming up, coming, and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country not, may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, 
and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So jo Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command and people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all Egypt. <coughs> Pharaoh gave Joseph the name of Zaphonath, Pania, and gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph, Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. This is the word of the Lord. Before we open God's word, let's come into his presence. Uh, let's pray. Father, some of us have come from very busy and difficult week. Others, not so much. But each one of us would thank you for your goodness and your grace that has strengthened us, that we have been able to know your presence with us day by day. Now this morning we come to see this experience of Joseph, a man who at this time in his life was disappointed with the way that things had turned out for him. Father, open our ears and our spiritual eyes. Grant to us understanding that even in those days of difficulty that we face, we might know your presence with us. Hear our prayer Father, we pray, and forgive your servant, for his sins are many. We have come this morning to see Jesus afresh. We pray in his name. Amen. I want to uh, uh, begin this morning by just asking you a very simple question. Have you ever been lost? Have you ever been lost? And I don't mean down the aisles of a supermarket. <laughs> Neither am I talking of the kind of Dr. Michael Mosley kind of lost, which brought tragic consequences. If you've ever been lost, can you remember how you felt? The fears that may have gone through your mind. I remember as a teenager, I belonged uh, and uh, went through uh, Boys Brigade. And uh, one weekend, eight of us were out on a hike and camping uh, out in the Southern Alps uh, there in the South Island of New Zealand. And we misread the map. We got lost. 
We had an appointed time to get to the uh, campsite we were heading for. The sun was setting, the night was beginning to fall. We wandered around in the dark aimlessly for some time until finally, I think it was around about nine o'clock in the evening, we turned into a valley. And there down in the distance were the lamps of the campsite waiting for us. The anxiety in our hearts that had been building up simply drained away. That incident reminds me a little of the importance of hope that we as men and women so desperately need in our lives. I believe in the significance of the power of hope uh, today more than ever. You could take away some person's wealth and they might well be hindered. You could take away some person's wealth and they may well be handicapped. You could take away some person's purpose and they will be slowed and, and may be well confused. But brothers and sisters, if we take away hope, then we become slowed and often confused. We often become uh, plunged into a deep darkness. We can often become paralysed. And so we verbalise our fears and our despair. Why did this happen? How much longer will this last? Will this cold, dark winter ever end? And some of the most cherished scriptures that we have in God's word are those that promise hope in the midst of affliction. When God says, listen up, I want to tell you that this is worth it. Believe me, trust me, I will reward you for your waiting. And when those experiences come, we appreciate something uh, of what we find in the 23rd chapter of Job. Remember Job in the Old Testament, he's a man who's been bruised. He's been beaten by calamity, he's lost his children, he's lost his home, his health has been destroyed. And as he meditates and as he thinks on the situation that he finds himself in, he begins to think about God. And in Job chapter 23 and verse 10, we have these words. Job is speaking. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. The key to that verse, of course, is the first phrase, uh, the second phrase. When he has tested me. And the tests of life are often God's way and God's process for refining us. We know that uh, if you've seen documentaries about the way gold is produced, that purifying gold is often lengthy. It's a painstaking process. Well, affliction comes to God's people. And affliction is the gold in the making of the child of God. But we must always remember it is God who determines the length of the refining. There's a great hymn, we're going to sing it soon after this message, entitled, How Firm a Foundation. And the third verse contains these words. When through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, his grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt you, his only design, your dross to consume and your gold to refine. And so this is something of the background that we have in Joseph's story in Genesis 41. 
Right up until this time, Joseph's life has been filled with injustice, with suffering, and with great disappointment. But behind the scenes, God is in the process of making gold in his life. And Genesis 41 gives us what we also are waiting for, for deliverance, for for recognizing and, and knowing that God is faithful. God can be trusted. And so we look forward to the deliverance and the exaltation, not only of our own lives, but here in Genesis 41 of Joseph. And so this morning, I just want to look briefly at the principles we learn from this section of his life. We open in chapter 41 and verse 1 with these words, when two full years had passed. Now remember how last week we saw how Joseph uh, helped the king's cupbearer. The cupbearer was in prison. He'd had a dream. He came to Joseph. Joseph interprets the dream. And uh, as a result, and of the freedom that the cupbearer gained, Joseph had asked the cupbearer, listen, when you stand before Pharaoh, please remember me to him when you stand before him. But to the end of chapter 40 and verse 23, we read these disappointing words. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. He's not only forgotten by whom he thought was a friend, but now he discovers he's left in a dungeon for two years. We may well ask, well, why did God allow this to happen to Joseph's life? Well, obviously, God is not yet through with the refining process in the life of Joseph. God still has some lessons to teach his servant before the next assignment. What happened during those long two years in a dungeon? Well, humanly speaking, we might well say not much. He just faced the same long, monotonous days, day after day, with their regular routines. And I'm sure going through Joseph's mind, there was the question, wasn't there? He must have wondered, what's going on? Where is God? Why is this happening? But because Joseph was a man who remained faithful, God was able to use him with great reward two years after he used him in prison for no reward. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't know what's going on in your heart or your life this this morning or at this time. Maybe you're feeling a little like Joseph. Maybe you're experiencing something of what Joseph did when he was younger. Maybe you had goals, plans, vision. And all of those seemed to be floundering. Every door that you tried seemed to shut in your face. Or maybe you feel like, well, what's life all about? that life is kind of passing you by with an increasing sense of insignificance. Whatever your situation, and if some of those things and others describe your situation, then I would very graciously suggest that you turn your heart toward God. That you learn to wait on him that you leave the realisation of your dreams to God himself. Allow God to handle the cupbearers of your life who can often forget and mistreat you, even break their promises. 
So here's the first principle we discover in this chapter with Joseph. During times of waiting, let God encourage you, but be faithful. Some of us may well be able to identify with the words of a Canadian Christian, a lady by the name of Ruth Calkin. She experienced a lot of pain in her life and she penned these words during one particularly painful experience she was going through. She wrote this, All through the long dreary hours of this rough toilsome day, I have struggled to believe that your plan is good, that the blows and bruises will establish me, that the staggering changes will settle me. I have struggled to believe that your way is perfect. But waiting here alone, shrouded in thick loneliness, I confess I don't see it. Frankly, I just don't see that your way is perfect. And now I hear you say, I didn't say you would see it. I only said it is. So Lord, it's your move. Good night. Some of us may feel like Ruth did a long time ago. What's the future? Where's the door? How do I get through this? The Apostle Paul, I think, is instructive for us. In, in, in Galatians 6 verse 9, he writes this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So in other words, during those long days of waiting, when we're searching for what God might say to us, might do in us, let God encourage you. We can often fake waiting, can't we? We put on masks that say, well, we're at peace, we're happy, when we know that there's an awful amount of turmoil going on inside. Chuck Swindle is a US preacher. Some of you have probably read his books, maybe watched him on television. Uh, in one of his books, he tells the story of some American soldiers in Korea during the Korean War. And this military unit had hired a young boy to cook and to clean for them. But these military guys, they were, they were also kind of jokesters. And they quickly took advantage of this young boy's age and naivety. And so this little Korean guy that uh, they had uh, hired had an unbelievably positive attitude about life. He was always smiling. But these guys would play tricks on him, time after time after time, one after the other. So, for example, they'd smear Vaseline on the stove handles that would get all over his hands when he picked up the pots and pans. But he'd simply wipe his hands and keep on whistling and smiling and singing his way through the day. They put buckets of water above the door so he'd get soaked when he opened it. And then he'd go off and dry himself without any fuss. At one stage, they nailed his shoes to the floor during the night, so when he got up, he had to pull the nails out, slip on his shoes, but he did so as if nothing was happening to him. And day after day, this young boy takes the brunt of these practical jokes without saying anything, just keeps on doing what he has to do, smiling as he does it. Well, finally, the men got rather guilty about what they were doing. So they gathered around him and they were talking with him and they said, look, we've tried these jokes on you. We know that these pranks aren't terribly funny for you. We apologise. We're sorry. We're never going to take advantage of you again. 
Well, the little boy smiled up at them and then he said, so, so mo no more sticky on the stove. The guys went, no, 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 no. No more water on the door. No more water buckets on the door. No more nail shoes to the floor. No, 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 we'll stop that as well. Little boy looks at them with this big wide grin on his face. He says, okay, no more spit in the soup. <laughs> he looks so nice on the outside. He knew how to get his own back. But folks, sometimes, isn't it true, that even us, we, we're kind of spitting in the soup. We become difficult people to live with. This story reminds us that if we remain faithful in times of waiting, that God will come and encourage us. You see, God never left Joseph. But he rescued him at just the right time. And so in verses 2 to 40 of this chapter, we see this deliverance of Joseph that was granted. This is a turning point in Joseph's life. And it came on a day like no other. There's no advance warning. It's just another ordinary day. He wakes up in the morning, presumably has breakfast. It's just a day like yesterday and the day before. But during the day, this day became the day of his promotion. Because Pharaoh awoke. He'd been disturbed. He'd had a, a rough night. He'd had two strange dreams. The first one, here are seven fat, sleek cows and they've dev been devoured by seven ugly, thin cows. The second dream, here are seven plump, healthy ears of grain swallowed by seven thin ears that have been scorched by the wind. And Pharaoh <coughs> calls in his magicians, his counsellors, <coughs> but they couldn't unravel the meaning of this dream. And so Joseph's day arrives. And the king's cupbearer suddenly remembers his encounter with Joseph in prison two years previously. Joseph is brought before Pharaoh. He not only interprets his dreams, but counsels Pharaoh as to how to prepare for the famine. Which brings us to the second truth in the story that during times of advancement, let God exalt you. Be humble. Folks, put yourself in Joseph's place just for a moment. You've been a slave in Egypt for 13 years. For two years, you've been forgotten in prison. Now you're suddenly released and you become the highest official in the land. Only Pharaoh is above you. If that were you, would you have remained humble? Wouldn't it have been easy for Joseph to take advantage of the situation? Couldn't he stand there and voice his resentment against the cupbearer who'd forgotten him for two years? Why not? Now he's got the ear of Pharaoh. Payback time. Revenge. But none of this is Joseph's response. What stands out is the lack of any anger on Joseph's part. In, far, in fact, from the, the record of Joseph's life that we have, between the ages of 30 and 110, there is no word of resentment recorded by Joseph against his brothers 
who sold him into slavery when he was 17 years of age. No word of resentment against Potiphar's wife who falsely accused him of rape and caused him to be thrown into prison. No word of resentment against Potiphar who believed his wife's lies or against the cupbearer, his so-called friend who forgot him. I'm not sure I would have done that. Retain my, my coolness. Why doesn't Joseph seek revenge? Brothers and sisters, I think it's because of this truth. Because Joseph had kept his heart right. Joseph had not. And Joseph would not spit in the soup because he humbly accepted his situation as coming from God. And so in his answer to Pharaoh with regard to interpreting his dream, we note that Joseph turns attention away from himself, but points to God. So in verse 16, we have this, his words, I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. And so it's with humility and, it's in and with integrity that Joseph takes no credit for what is about to happen. His humility, I think, reveals, in fact, that he never expressed a desire for the job that he outlines to Joseph. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. How easy it would have been for Joseph to say, listen, Joseph, you want help? You want to know how to do this? He's standing in front of you. I'm here. He could have easily hinted about his own qualifications I'd be really pleased to serve you, Pharaoh. This was the moment to sell himself. But he didn't promote himself at all. He left his situation in God's hands. Brothers and sisters, isn't that so unlike us? We live in a world that expects us to sell ourselves. Put yourself forward. Manipulate ways so you get into positions of greater authority or greater status. How often we, we, we work hard to convince others we're the ones who can do the job. But it's not true of Joseph. And so I think Pharaoh comes to the realisation that standing before him is a young man but an extraordinary man. Maybe he'd heard of, of, of Joseph's success in organising Potiphar's house. Or from the prison warden, just how Joseph ordered prison life. So Joseph's faithfulness begins to pay dividends. And Pharaoh can see that Joseph's capabilities, that, that there's something different about him. That there's, there's a supernatural aspect to him. So he compares Joseph, this man, with all the wise men he's consulted in the past who live in Egypt. Had Joseph come to Pharaoh two years previous, there'd been no need. Pharaoh wouldn't have needed to compare him with anybody else because the situation hadn't arisen of famine a prospective famine at that point in time. God knows his timing. We need to trust him. And the truth is this, friends, that when you are faithful in times of waiting, there is no, time, no need to exalt yourself in times of advancement. Remember the Apostle Peter? In 1 Peter chapter 5, he writes these words. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. 
The proper time has come for Joseph. And as we close, friends, this third truth or principle, during times of reward, let God use you, but be fruitful. In an instant, Joseph's life changed. He was rewarded for the character within him that had developed during and over those previous years. The truth is, Pharaoh didn't know anybody in his kingdom who was as wise or as discerning as Joseph. And so he places God's man in authority over both his household and his people. Joseph is second in command to the king across all of Egypt. Thirteen years previously, he, he'd been brought as a slave to Egypt. Now he stands as prime minister of this great country. Joseph has unlimited territorial and financial power. He wears the king's own signet ring on his finger. He has privileged access to all the riches of Egypt. He has political and religious authority. And Joseph is only 30 years of age when he's given all this power. Few men, few people have ever had so much power at such a young age truth be known, many at that age wouldn't know how to handle that kind of power. But Joseph here is an exception. And it's because of his background that he has been prepared for this next honour, this next step, this next stage of his life. The dark threads of his life are beginning to form into a beautiful tapestry. I'm sure that past memories must have flooded back to him. Some very pleasant, some very painful. But through those years that God was acting in his life, he had been humbled. This new authority that he now had, standing before all the people of Egypt, could well have puffed him up with pride. But brothers and sisters, Joseph was a man who had learnt to trust God. He'd seen God work in his life and on his behalf. God has prepared him through the years for this fruitful ministry. So the principle is this. During times of reward, let God use you. Be fruitful. What did all this fame and this power and this fortune do to Joseph? What was he like inside? Well, I think this scripture passage reminds us and tells us that his heart belonged to God. He was a faithful man. He was faithful to the power that Pharaoh bestowed upon him. He was faithful to the people of Egypt among whom he served and worked. He was faithful to his wife, Asenath. Even the names that he gave his two sons indicate something about Joseph's heart because we're told he had two sons. He names the first Manasseh. God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. What a testimony. The past is behind him. I hold no grudges. I don't want revenge. God has made me forget. And his second son, Ephraim, God has made me fruitful in the land of my misfortune. I've forgotten. Now I'm fruitful. 
Now, it's pretty obvious, I think, that the sting of the past, those experiences that did hurt him, remained with him. He could remember the abuse. He could remember when his brothers threw him into a pit. He could remember when he was sold as a slave to the Ishmaelites and was sold on again in Egypt. But he no longer felt the pain of those experiences because he saw that God's hand was through it all. And so due to that attitude of heart, he was free to be used by God for 80 years. Brothers and sisters, I think that's what God wants of each one of us as well. He longs for us to be fruitful in spite of the affliction and the hurt and the pain and the tragedies that we've been through. But we have a choice to make. We need to leave the resentment of those experiences behind. We need to leave the sting of the past behind. I want to close this morning just by reading the testimony of a lady who many of you will have heard, uh, heard of, Corrie Ten Boom. She wrote a follow-up book to her biography, uh, The Hiding Place. It's called Tramp for the Lord. And in it, she describes her release from the Nazi concentration camp, Ravensbrück, that she was interred in for several years. Corey Ten Boom could have, like Joseph, resented the experiences that came her way. Her whole family was wiped out. She was the only member of the family that survived. Listen to her words. When you are dying and when you stand at the gate of eternity, you see things from a different perspective than when you think you may live for a long time. I'd been standing at that gate for many months, living in Barrack 28 in the shadow of the crematorium. Every time I saw the smoke pouring from the hideous smokestacks, I knew it was the remains of some woman who had been with me in Ravensbrook. And often I asked myself, when will it be my time to be killed or die? But I was not afraid. Following Betsy's death, that's her sister, following Betsy's death, God's presence was even more real. Even though I was looking into the valley of the shadow of death, I was not afraid. Because it is here that Jesus comes the closest, taking our hands and leading us through. One week before the order came to kill all the women of my age, I was free. I still do not understand all the details of my release from Ravensbrook. All I know is it was a miracle of God. I stood in the prison yard with the others, waiting the final order. Beyond the walls with their strands of barbed wire stood the silent trees of the German forest, looking so much like the grey-green sets at the back of one of our theatre stages in Holland. Mimi, one of my fellow prisoners, came within whispering distance. Tiny died this morning, she said, without looking at me. And so did Marie. Tiny. Oh Lord, thank you for letting me point her to Jesus, who has now ushered her safely into your presence. And Marie, I knew her well. She lived in my barracks, and she had attended my Bible talks. Like Tiny, 
Marie had also accepted Jesus as her Lord. And I look back at the long row of barracks. Lord, if it was only for Tiny and Marie that they might come to know you before they died, then it was all worthwhile. A guard spoke harshly, telling Mimi to leave the yard. And then he said to me, face the gate. Do not turn around. The gate swung open and I glimpsed the lake in front of the camp. I could smell freedom. Follow me, a young girl in an, in an officer's uniform said to me. I walked slowly through the gate, never looking back. Behind me I heard the hinges squeak as the gate swung shut. I was free. And flooding through my mind were the words of Jesus to the church he wrote, uh, to the church at Philadelphia. See, I have set before you an open door that no one can shut. Brothers and sisters, God says the same thing to you and to me. There will be open doors in our lives that no person can shut. But we need to be faithful to God during those times of waiting. And when those doors swing open as they did for Corey long ago, God will make you fruitful because of the experiences he's taken you through in the midst of your suffering and your affliction. The tapestry of your life is being woven. Even now, shall we pray? Our Father, across the years, many of us have had different experiences. For some of us, suffering and affliction has, has cut deep. For others, not so much. There have been dis disappointments in life. All of us, to different degrees and in different ways, have known what it is to be let down by friends, maybe family. We've known what it is to have been hurt, to experience pain. Yet, Father, the story of Joseph comes to us afresh this morning and brings us fresh hope. That in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of life's disappointments, in the midst of the great questions that we ask and wrestle with, you have been with us, shaping us, moulding us, turning us into to the people, the men and women you want us to be. Father, we've still got life ahead of us. We don't know for how long. It may be long days, they may be short days. But you have promised to always be with us through every circumstance of life. And so we are not a lost people. We are not a people who are without hope. For you are with us, leading us, guiding us, sustaining us, strengthening us. And for that, we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.